Welcome to Thought Crime and Keto Crime, where Tracy does the sleuthing so you don't have to. Hey everyone, welcome back to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today I thought we'd take it a little bit casual. I'm outside on my porch. It's kind of a partially cloudy day here in Tennessee, so it's nice and cool out here, about 67 degrees. I uh, had some rain last night, so it's everything's nice and open, uh, so please excuse any uh, background noise. Got a, a hound dog barking over in the distance. I live in a very country area, so got some, got some hound dogs over in the bi uh, distance doing their business. But I thought we'd just sit together, have a nice long chat about the murder of Meredith Kutchner. That's right, the Amanda Knox case. And the reason I say the murder of Meredith Kutchner is so often, they, she's forgotten. It's all about Amanda Knox. Now, nothing against Amanda Knox. I do think she was wrongfully convicted. And, of course, her story should be told. But I think Meredith's story is not always told. So I'm going to try to tell as much of her story along with Amanda's story as I can. So, let's relax, grab a cup of coffee, and uh, join me for what may be a, a three-parter. I've already filmed uh, a conversation with my good friend Michelle Muldoon, which will go up as the final part of this, so let's get into it. Murder of Meredith Kushner. Okay, let's start with Amanda because she's the one we know that know the best. And then as we move further in her story, we'll get into the other players in this. Amanda was born July 9th, 1987 in Seattle, Washington. She was the daughter of a teacher and an accountant for the local Macy's store. She grew up in a uh, traditional middle class uh, upbringing, a very close family, brothers and sisters. And then her parents divorced. But her parents had a very civil divorce and lived within walking distance of each other so that the children could see both their parents, even though her mother did remarry. But her, her and her stepfather were pretty close. Amanda was known as a very bright child, did very well in school. So no problems there. She fell in love with the art of Italy, often dreamed of going there. She studied the classics. She had a great passion for the works of Michelangelo, Raphael, all the, all the masters, and really talked about her love of anything classical. And that includes, excuse me, I just snorted. <laughs> and that includes uh, languages, and she was very interested in foreign languages. So she decided she was going to go to the University of Washington and study linguistics, which is the study of foreign languages. And she became fluent in French and German and wanted to study Italy in an emulsive environment. So what's the best way of doing that? Moving to an Italian-speaking country and immersing yourself into it. So that's what she decided to do her senior year in 2007 is to move to Italy as an exchange student and study as an exchange student there. And that's what she did. She worked three jobs to save her money. She was not a trust fund baby, was not, you know, some princess that got everything handed to her. No, she had to work. She came from a very traditional middle class family. So she worked really hard. One thing also that she did, she was very athletic. She loved soccer. She was one of the more aggressive soccer players on her high school and college intramural team. And as a result, she earned the nickname Foxy Noxy because of her aggressiveness in play of soccer. This nickname would come back to haunt her later during the, the trial. But remember, it was given to her because of her aggressiveness in playing soccer not because of her sexuality or anything like that, which is what it got turned into. So, she moves to the Italian city of Perugia. Perugia is the Italian version of a college town centered right in the middle of the country. If you look at the country, uh, the country of Italy, the boot shape, it's right in the middle of the boot. And it's a very old city going all the way back to Etruscan times where it was a fortress to protect 
Rome from invading, you know, invading tribes like Hannibal and Carthage and things like that. So it's a very ancient city and it has become a university center where a lot of universities have exchange programs with the university there and so you have a lot of different nationalities moving in there. So it's kind of like it's hard to find a native Perugia in there. It's mostly transplants. So that's the kind of city that she moved to, which was not unusual at all. When she traveled to Perugia to study at the University of Perugia, she settled in a flat, a four student, well, actually an eight student flat. She had the top part. There were more, uh, there were more apartments below, but she shared the top part of this flat that would become very important at Via della Perugula 7. That was her her address in Perugia, she actually shared with three other girls. Two Italian women that were studying law, Filomeno Romanelli and Laura Mazzetti. They were both in their late 20s, so 26, 27, and 22-year-old Meredith Kutchner. Kirchner, who was a exchange student from the University of Leeds in Great Britain. Meredith Kircher was born December 28, 1985 in Southwark section of South London. She was known as Mez to most of her friends, had a great love of music and especially politics. She traveled a lot, fell in love with uh, Italy because of a uh, summer trip she took with her family there at 15 and wanted to get into the folds of politics within the European Union. So it was a very exciting time. The European Union was still fairly new. So she wanted to get into that scene. And to do that, she had to study politics and had to be multilingual. So she decided in her senior year that she would too would journey to the University of Perugia and study politics there and become fully immersed in Italian culture. And she did. And she ended up rooming with Amanda and the, the two Italian law students. Now, Mez was also very interested in music. She was even in a couple of music videos filmed in her hometown of London. I'll insert a few clips here. A life filled with possibilities. This is her acting in a music video back home in England. So she was known as a very quiet, reserved girl, a very dedicated student, which is what many people say led to some conflict, supposed conflict between her and Amanda Knox. The other two roommates, Filomeno and Laura, were also pretty astute students. And according to everyone in the house, Amanda was more of the party girl, liked to go out, liked to see the sights. But they were older as was Maya, she was a couple of years older. Amanda was 20. She zoomed through college because she had a very high IQ, did very, very well. And yeah, went out. I can't say that I wouldn't do the same. And I was pretty much a homebody in college too. So anyway, so these were the four occupants of that top part of the house. The lower part of the house was occupied by four young Italian men, which Kircher and Knox both hung around about, hung around with on a daily. These four boys also had another friend that hung around, kind of couch surfed in the area, and also played basketball with them by the name of Rudy Ged, who was a young transplant from the Ivory Coast of Africa. He was known to have a record for drugs, petty theft, and assault. Now, I don't understand how someone like that even got into the country, but that's what we were dealing with. And he was a friend of the four young Italian men that lived below the Gladys. And he would often hang out playing basketball, uh, hanging out with them. And he also knew the ladies as a result of hanging out there. By all accounts, the young ladies got along just fine. They hung out together one night, just a couple of weeks after joining about 
of coming to Perugia and learning to get to know each other, they decided to go out to a night of classical music. And it was there that Amanda, who was forever obsessed with Harry Potter, she had just read the first Harry Potter book in German and was trying to read the second in Italian, looked across the music hall and saw a young man that reminded her of an Italian Harry Potter. He wanted me. His name, Raffaele Solicito, who was a young... 23-year-old soft, graduate software engineer student, also at the University of Perugia, whose father was a very well-known urologist in Italy, and as a result, he did not have to have roommates. He had his own flat that his father paid for that had some plumbing problems that will become important later. Also along this time, it was noted that Kirshner spent a lot of time with Knox, and Kirshner had even started dating a young Italian with the last name Silizetti. We don't know a lot about him, but she had become romantically involved with him. And she also hung out quite a bit at the bar where Amanda worked as a barmaid. Now, it was owned by a young Congolese man by the name of Patrick Lumumba. And... He was very friendly with all the college students that came around there, also very friendly with his uh, employees, was known to hang out with them, smoke a little weed. Now listen, weed was legal in Italy at that time, so smoking around, especially in a college town, is not as unusual as it may seem, certainly not. Even in the United States, in a college town, you're going to have a lot of marijuana use. The same was here, and they just spoke it a little more openly. Because... When I say illegal, maybe I should have said it was so more decriminalized. It was kind of more accepted than it was in the United States. So it was not unusual for people just to smoke it in public, which it Patrick would hang out with his employees, smoke, became very, very close with them. So it was not unusual for Patrick to text his employees and them to text him back and to otherwise have a very friendly relationship with him. I've had jobs like that. They turn out to be uh, pretty, pretty cool. All right, so let's fast forward to a tr one tragic day in the fall of 2007. November 1st, 2007, it was a public holiday. A lot of Italians were away. They had gone out. Amanda was spending because she had, remember, she had only met Raffaele about a week before this, but they had instantly become attracted and had started what I call a 20-year-old romance, sleeping together, uh, smoking weed, hanging out, spending every minute of the day together. She was actually staying over at his house that night. About 5 p.m., they had a, there was actually a movie rented on Raffaele's computer. They said they smoked weed, they had sex, they were just hanging out, and Amanda was supposed to go to work about 9 p.m. that night, but she got a text from Patrick saying because of the holiday, weren't a lot of people expected in the bar, she should just take the night off. So she actually texted him back, okay, and I, in, in Italian said, I will see you later. All right, so Amanda was going, Amanda spent the night with Raffaele. They woke up early the next day. She was going to take a shower, but couldn't because of the very bad plumbing in Raffaele's flat. And he said, Okay, you go home, which they were within walking distance. You go home, get a shower, come back. I'm going to call my father and get this plumbing worked out once and for all. So she leaves, goes back to her flat. She finds the door of the flat unlocked, which was very unusual. She walks in. Uh, she walks in, notices really nothing going on in the front room until she walks into the bathroom and notices blood on the sink, blood on the floor, and then just happens to walk over to Kirchner's door, attempts to open it, and it's locked. So she picks up her phone and attempts to call Kirchner's phone. There was no answer, so she begins to get scared. She walks outside, calls Raffaele, who comes over. He, too, of course, notices that the door, the blood in the bathroom, the door is locked, so he does what he thinks is best, and he calls the police. 
By this time, her other two roommates have come out. Uh, they are all having the same kind of fears as they tried to get in contact with Meredith. No answer. And they call and they wait for the police. The police arrive, but they send two postal inspectors or two postal policemen instead. Them real, seeing the blood, realizing this could be more than just a missing person or somebody having an, an illness or something like that, they decide that it's a little too much for them, so they call the military police and regular police and decide to wait. However, the police did not arrive until a little after one that day, and as a result, the postal police, not knowing quite how to handle a crime scene, allowed all the roommates and Raffaele to mill about the apartment, touch things, and so you had a very disturbed crime scene. When the regular police arrived, there had been a lot of disturbance. They immediately asked the roommates to call her phone one last time. They did. They did hear it ringing in the house, so they knew something was aghast, and they decided to break in the door. At this time, Meredith was found in her room, throat slit, towel across her face, and obviously deceased and had been for some time. The level of the body was rigor mortis was starting to, to kick in, so it was obvious she'd been dead for quite a while. There was a kitchen knife found in the room. There was also blood all over the place. There was a bloody footprint that obviously was from a Nike shoe. There was a bloody thumbprint under the pillow on Meredith's head. There was a bloody um, handprint on the wall. There was blood tracked from Meredith's room into the bathroom. Now, there are 47 cuts and bruises on her neck, legs, face, inside her mouth. Her clothes ripped off and around her body etched in blood a shoe print, a handprint on the wall, a footprint on the bath mat in the bathroom, drops of blood on the faucet. Meredith Kircher had studied karate. It's clear she fought hard. This time, Amanda was outside making a phone call to her mother and said that she heard the door crack open and then she heard what she thought to be people speaking Italian very quickly and in a very distressed manner. So at that time, she hung up and she went in and told me to discover her her roommate had. The first two detectives on the scene were Monica Napoleoni and Marco Chicharira. Now, Napoleoni was the one that did all the initial interviews of Amanda and Raffaele and the other people that lived in the house. She was very hostile toward Amanda from the beginning. In fact, honed in on why the police weren't called as soon as she arrived there after, you know, 9.30 in the morning, why, why didn't she call immediately? Uh, Knox simply informed her she didn't immediately think anything was wrong. It was only after she got into the bathroom that she saw the blood and then realized Meredith's door was locked and she couldn't get her on the phone that she became distressed. She did then call her boyfriend because she said she wasn't sure of what to do. He came over, he called the police, and then they sent their own type of police investigators. But... Napoleoni seemed to take that as more Amanda complaining and blaming the police, I think, for the lack of response. So, yeah, wasn't a very pleasant um, uh, relationship between Napoleoni and Knox. They actually uh, began to ask all of the members of the household to come to the police station for an interrogation as they did their dusting of the crime scene. And it was noted that Rudy Gend, who, Ged, who would become quite an intricate player, had already left town by this time. Uh, he was staying, as I said, down below with the other uh, young men that lived below, and they were noted as telling Napoleoni he had left suddenly. This was noted. All right. So over the next few days from November 2nd through about November 4th, all of the roommates were interrogated at the local police precinct. All of them were interrogated fairly quickly except for Raffaele and Amanda who were interrogated a total of 56 hours over those four days. Um, it was noted that during the interrogation, 
uh, Napoleoni, after questioning the other two female roommates, were told that perhaps there was a beef between Kirchner and and Amanda Knox because Amanda was a partier, Mer uh, Meredith wasn't, so there seemed to be maybe there was issues there. Um, that they commented that Amanda, after the police had left on the first night and they were discussing it, one of them had said, I hope Meredith didn't suffer too much, and they quoted Amanda as saying, of course she suffered, her effing throat was slit. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that was at best tacky, I think, uh. But I can also understand how I was at 20 and how I might have been equally sarcastic. Like, duh, of course she suffered. What are you even talking about? You know, I think that's how she meant it and how later on she said she meant it, even though she said she regretted ever saying it. So her and Raffaele were interrogated. It was also noted during the interrogation that the other people waiting in the waiting room said that she was turning cartwheels and she was doing yoga stretches, and she was being very romantic with Raffaele, and later on Amanda said that, yes, she was doing some stretches, she did the splits, she does not recall doing a cartwheel, uh, but she said she was just relieving stress, because she had been held there at the police precinct over the last few days, so I can only imagine how stressful that was. Uh, by November 4th, Napoleoni and Chichereri had told the public that it was someone known to Meredith that probably killed her, and it was that same day that the interrogations of Raffaele and Amanda Knox turned up. Raffaele has later said that he was interrogated, yelled at, screamed at, basically honing in on the fact that he was saying that Amanda was there at his apartment all night and there was no way she could have left to do this crime. And he was supposedly led into thinking that maybe she could have. He said that the police officer said, well, don't you think she could have slipped out in the middle of the night? It's only a few minutes walk. Um, it's very possible she could have left and you not know it. And he said, at that point he became scared and he actually said, well, maybe she did leave. On the other side of the precinct, they were also interrogating Amanda. Amanda said she was even slapped. She was hit in the back of the head. She was yelled at. She was never allowed. She was only allowed an interpreter after a lot of pleading. She was basically led into admitting who that someone that she knew who killed Meredith. And she said they kept honing in on her pat on her boss Patrick by saying that because she told Patrick via phone that she was going to see him later, that meant she was going to see him later that night, was that at the back of the house when they sexually assaulted and murdered Meredith. She tried to explain that to them that in the English, it simply means see, see you later, means I'll see you soon, whenever, whenever I see you again. However, in Italian, it means that I will indeed see you later that same day. So that's what they were honing in on. And she said after a being pretty much delirious, no food, no water, very few bathroom breaks. She was in a daze, and she did finally say, well, Patrick was there that night, and he might have killed Meredith. Now, I think of everything that Amanda did, that was the worst. Um, I don't understand the delirium she was under, so I can't speak to that sort of stress, but I, I could see maybe implicating myself more than another person under duress, but then again, they had led Rudy, or excuse me, Raffaele, to implicate Amanda too. It seemed they were all honing in on Amanda, and also during that time, they had dug up the fact that she smoked weed, she was sexually, had been sexually loose, that is, she had a lot of premarital sex, but Raffaele was also doing the same thing, and it seemed that the, the story put forth by the investigators was one of a witch from America, drug and sex induced, possibly in a satanic, satanic uh, cult of some sort, had led their poor Italian boy astray and had killed, killed Meredith. But nevertheless, Amanda, in a stupor, did implicate Patrick. 
Patrick was arrested. He said from that time on that Amanda ruined his business, his life, and everything. He was completely exonerated later on when it was proven he was not there. He had plenty of people that had seen him working in the bar that night that said he was at work until well after midnight. So, and even his roommate said he came home. So he was cut loose, but he said it was enough to ruin his life. And I can completely contribute to that. Amanda has come forward many times since she regret what happened, but she truly felt she was led into it. In fact, she was forced, she said, under duress to sign a confession written in Italian, which she could barely understand and was not allowed a lawyer or anything. So I think there was a huge abuse of power at, at the Perugia Police Department. I really enter lead investigator and later on lead prosecutor Giuliano Magini. He was actually known in Italy as a specialist in cult killings and other things of that nature. He actually put forth the argument. He was the one that put forth the idea that Amanda was evidently involved with the Freemasons or some other secret organization and was involved in satanic practices and had led Raffaele astray and therefore done the murder of Meredith in a satanic or ritualistic way. And it was shortly after his appointment that Marco Cicciarelli actually removed himself from the investigation, leaving Gi Giuliano Mangini and Napoleoni in charge. In fact, Cicciarelli has been quoted as saying he thought a lot of the arrests were mistakes and never should have been done. But it seemed that the narrative they were going for in those early days was that Raffaele, Amanda, and Patrick had killed Meredith in some Masonic, satanic, ritual killing. However, because a lot of the DNA evidence at the site was disturbed, it was not the best handled. But what it did reveal is some things that totally countered the earlier, um, earlier findings that said that the bloody Nike footprint on the uh, bedroom and the bathroom were actually Raffaele's. DNA was taken from everyone that lived in the house and it was discovered that all of the blood, most of the blood in the bathroom and the bedroom was Meredith's because she had bled out a lot. Some of Amanda's blood was also found in the bathroom, but she went on to explain that's because she lived there. She had cut herself cooking. She had had a menstrual period while living there, so it was not unusual that her blood could have been in the sink or on the toilet in any number of places. She could have had infected gums at some point and brushed her teeth and her blood would have been in the sink. What I'm saying is her DNA was supposed to be there. They had said earlier that the bloody Nike footprint found in the bedroom belonged without a doubt to Raffaele, but it was later discovered that he did not have a pair of shoes that matched that pattern. But who did? Rudy Gid. It, he, it was found that those were his shoes, his fingerprints and handprints, which were on file because he was already an arrested criminal for burglary and drugs and other things, that the bloody handprint was perfectly his handprint. The bloody thumbprint underneath Meredith's pillow was also perfectly his thumbprint and that those were his shoes in the bathroom. So he was arrested along with Amanda and Raffaele. A few days later, he had fled to Germany and was arrested in Germany, extradited back to Italy, and was interrogated. And he at first said that he had gone home. Uh, he had been hanging out with Meredith. They had gone upstairs to have sex. This, they had done the deed. He got up. He went into the bathroom. He then heard a scuffle in the bedroom, went back in. He saw a tall man over Meredith. He had cut, he had evidently cut Meredith's throat. She was bleeding. He fought with the man. The man left. He tried to staunch the flow of blood from Meredith's throat with the towel that was found over her head, but he could not save her because he was already a convicted criminal. He was afraid to, um, afraid to call the police, so he simply fled. That was the story. He never once implicated Amanda until several hours later, again, interrogation 
the same interrogation methods I'm sure they used on Amanda and Raffaele. He later said, yes, Amanda was there and she watched. He was tried separately in 2008 and was sentenced to 16 years for the murder of Meredith Kushner. Now, Raffaele and Amanda were kept in custody until their trials began at the trial. Again, McGinney brought out that he thought it was a satanic ritualistic killing. He brought out that he thought it was an orgy gone wrong. Lots and lots of things. The police department did testify that they gave Amanda access to food and water and bathroom breaks during their interrogation. However, they did not film them, so we have no way of proving it. Simply Amanda's word against their word, and then Raffaele's word against their word. However, they were found guilty and sentenced to 26 years for Amanda, 25 years for Raffaele, and were placed in prison near Perugia, Italy. Amanda's parents had pretty much mortgaged and taken out loans of everything that they had to come to Italy. They never left Italy. They stayed there. They went to see their daughter whenever they could get into the prison to see her. They were always there. They were there 100% of the time. Did you think what it was costing them spiritually, actually? I felt incredibly guilty for what they were having to sacrifice for me. And there was a certain point in my in my thinking in prison that if it didn't work out and I never was free again, I I was trying to figure out how I could ask them to move on with their life without me. While there, she started what would, would become her book, Waiting to be Heard. She had, a luckily, an American roommate. She said they sang the Star Spangled Banner every morning. They talked uh, about their lives back home. She said those things kept her sane. Even though she did say, say she had some bouts with suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts, and later on confessed that she was sexually abused and sexually... Uh, harassed by not only guards but other prisoners there as well so it was not a great place to be for amanda her and raffaele were in jail almost four years over 1400 nights is how she claimed it before their italian defense teams actually got the appeal up to the appellate court who then overturned it and said they were to be freed immediately because of the way the investigation was handled, the interrogation was handled, and more importantly, the way that the DNA was messed with and could no longer be be used. Pretty much the prosecution's case was all circumstantial. It was based on the, um, the, the imagination of McGinney, who saw some kind of cult figure. It was never, never based on scientific evidence. The only fingerprints that were found in Meredith's bedroom besides Meredith's was Rudy's. The only DNA of Meredith's that was found were in places she should have been because she lived there. Uh, they even brought out that her DNA was found on the kitchen knife. Well, she said she used that kitchen knife to cook. They even said that they found a very small amount of Raffaele's DNA on Meredith's bra clasp. But that bra clasp had been found the day of the murder, it, but it was never seen again until several days later when it was found in another area of the house, evidently being kicked across the house. And it could have picked up Raffaele's DNA from that because he was dating Amanda. He was in the house. So Raffaele was sent home. Uh, Amanda flew back to Seattle, Washington immediately and tried to take up her life again. However, in 2013, the prosecutors decided to retry the case. Now, Italian justice system is not like the American justice system. She could never be retried here for the same thing because of double jeopardy laws. That does not apply in Italy. They can restart a trial, introduce new evidence in Italy. So double jeopardy does not apply. And she refused to go back to Italy. I don't blame her. And so she hired Italian lawyers to handle her defense. 
And because of the knife DNA that it was found, her DNA on the handle, Meredith's on the blade, I mean, it was the murder weapon. We've established that. She was found, her and Raphael were found guilty and sentenced to 28 years for Amanda, 26 for Raffaele. She refused to return to Italy. Uh, even now president uh, Donald Trump weighed in and said he thought she was innocent and this was uh, a miscarriage of justice and he would look very disfavorably if the American government did extradite her. So the For the past few years, you mentioned to me that you spoke with her father uh, this afternoon. What did he say? Well, he couldn't have been happier. It's about time that this happened. I mean, it's ridiculous. She was never guilty. The, all the evidence proved that. If you look at this prosecutor, he has his own issues. He's got a terrible reputation and a terrible past. And he had just a thing. It was just, he had this thing about her somehow and probably has it about other people too. So it was time. And hopefully she's now going to recapture her life and do a good job in doing it and maybe frankly become a big star and somehow she can get some dividends out of this nightmare for her american government had a pretty hard decision to make she was not required to return to italy until an appeal had been heard so if that appeal was heard and, uh, and they upheld that decision then the united states would have to make the decision the obama administration at the time <coughs> would have to make the decision whether or not to extradite her. And a lot of celebrities and high-level politicians weighed in and said they thought she was innocent. And for some reason, the Italian justice system there were messing with her because she was a sexually active American girl. A lot of slut-shaming going on here. Finally, 2015, the nightmare ends. The Supreme Court of Italy ruled that there was not enough solid evidence to convict either of them. Well, they did say they had enough evidence to convict Raffaele. I don't get that, but they weren't going to. I don't know if they were just trying to save face, but okay. But they literally said there was not enough evidence, solid evidence to convict Amanda. So they overturned both guilties and they also exonerated her of these crimes. She could never be tried again because the Supreme Court did exonerate her. Since then, Amanda has dedicated her life to uh, advocacy for people falsely accused in foreign countries. She has returned to Italy a couple of times to help other people falsely accused. Uh, she has become a uh, producer of her own documentary. Her book, Waiting to be Heard, has done very, very well. Uh, she recently got married. Uh, it was a little bit of a scandal there, trying to raise money for a wedding. We won't get into that. Michelle and I will talk about that in the second part. Also, um, Raffaele is back home in his hometown in Italy. Uh, he started a cons computer consultancy, which did really, really well, but then has recently became a true crime commentator on an Italian true crime television show. So... Both of them doing real well. Yes, they're making money off of this crime. I, I'm always torn on that, but you have to realize that they have been proven innocent. They can no longer be held up as guilty. I believe the guilty person, Rudy Gidd, is in prison. He's still in prison serving that sentence. 16 years was not enough for what he did to Meredith. I at first believed that they had consensual sex and that he killed her. They got into a fight and he killed her. I really believe he forced himself on her after reading more on it because his DNA was found all over the place, including in Meredith. So I really believe he tried to forcibly rape her. She fought back. She was a, a black belt in karate. I believe she fought back and he killed her. Now, that's what I believe. So my, my opinions on this case have changed as more and more evidence comes in. So that's kind of where I stand. To the Kirchner family, I can't imagine the pain they've gone through. I hope that they can rest in the laurel that the guilty party is in prison. And I hope he never gets out. I hope somebody does to him what he did to her in the, within the Italian prison system. I really do. You know, you can call me evil or whatever. I hope that happens. But um, anyway... That's kind of where we are with this case. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a long one. Got part two coming out later this weekend. 
Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, links are below. Let me know your opinion on this case. Leave that down below as well. Give me a, a like. Give me a share. Thanks a lot, guys. And until next time, Keto Comic out.